Now that we are well into fall and winter is quickly approaching, the days are getting shorter and running in daylight is becoming harder. Wazelle's premium reflective collection is designed with runner safety in mind. Both highly visible in the dark but subtle in the daytime, thanks to the tonal reflective print that only shines bright when reflecting the light. From tight shorts, jackets, and tanks to accessories like hats and gloves, with Wazelle's reflective collection, you can stay safe and stay seen. It is dark here in Cleveland where I've been running, so I just love Wazelle's reflective collection. I'm a big fan of the firecracker tights. The bird pattern is so cute, and they look all over sparkly at night. To check out the firecracker tights and the rest of the reflective collection, go to wazelle.com slash collection slash reflective, or even easier, click the banner link at the top of the Hear Her Sports website at hearhersports.com. You are listening to Hear Her Sports, a podcast for active, adventurous women who love hearing stories from other active, adventurous women. I'm your host, Elizabeth Emery. In every episode, I introduce a female athlete or woman in sport through a conversation about who they are and the terrific work they're doing. Today, I am speaking with Kim McKenney and Olivia Buffard nesbitt from Nordic Ski Lab, an online learning platform that uses videos to teach ski techniques used by competitive cross-country skiers. You will hear about the origins of Nordic Ski Lab, how Kim has grown as a businesswoman, how Kim and Olivia collaborate to make Nordic Ski Lab videos, some tips for summer roller skiing, Olivia's goals, being an older athlete, or is she? And Olivia offers an inside view of skiing for the national team. The three of us share a love of cross-country skiing, joy in all movement, constantly improving our technique, and the challenge of sport. It's an absolutely terrific conversation. But before we get to the episode, I am super excited to announce that Hear Her Sports has teamed up with Strides Forward and Keeping Track Podcasts to form a female athlete podcast network that we're calling Keeping Her Forward. And Keeping Her Forward is proud to be sponsored by TheFeed.com. The Feed is the largest online marketplace for your sports nutrition, offering the brands you know and love. From Scratch Labs, Cliff Bar to Morton, plus their athlete customized supplements called Feed Formulas. They offer over 250 brands, so you have thousands of products to choose from and to try. Also, what we love about The Feed is that their products are curated, meaning they spend a lot of time picking and choosing what they want to offer on their site. You know you are seeing the best products on the market when you go to thefeed.com. I've been ordering from The Feed for quite a while now, and what I've always liked is it's a one-stop shop. I can get what I need from all the brands I love all in one place, and they carry so much. For example, after reading Stacey Sims' new book, Next Level, I wanted to have some casein powder before bed, and the feed had exactly what I was looking for. It was so easy. In the show notes, I'll link to what I got, and of course to the feed. To get you started, Hear Her Sports and the feed are offering a special listener discount code, HEARHER15, for 15% off almost all feed products. So check them out, enjoy some new nutrition products or ones you've long used, and support a company that is supporting women's sports. And now on to meeting Kim and Olivia. Kim McKenney is the president and co-founder of Nordic Ski Lab. Her educational background is in biology and she has a master's degree in neuroscience. Kim is a certified ski coach who uses her own experiences, learning how to ski as an adult, combined with her expertise and demonstrations from world-class athletes to deliver affordable and easy to understand ski technique. What started as a passion project, born from a love of sport and a desire to see more people skiing like the pros, Nordic Ski Lab has grown into a popular site with thousands of members across the world. Olivia Bufard Nesbitt grew up on cross-country skis in a cross-country ski family, which made choosing to pursue a career in cross-country ski racing a natural choice for her. Olivia now lives in Canmore, Alberta, where she trains with the Alberta World Cup Academy. Olivia raced for three years on the Canadian national ski team, ending in 2018. Then, unfortunately, she had a period of injuries and illnesses, but she is now stronger than ever, thanks to lots of rehab that we'll hear about in the episode. With new strength and determination, she made the Canadian Olympic team for the 2022 Winter Olympic Games in Beijing. Olivia began working with Nordic Ski Lab in 2016, and she's a primary demo athlete for them and a technique consultant. 
Olivia self-identifies as a longtime ski enthusiast. She is incredibly passionate about the sport and passing on that passion. She works as a youth ski coach for Canmore Nordic, as well as the nonprofit Spirit North, which empowers indigenous youth in sport. Well, hello, you guys. It's such a treat to have you here. As regular listeners know, I am a cross-country skier, so this is particularly a treat for me to have you on the podcast. Thank you for having us. I'm very excited. Yeah, thanks for having us on. Sure. So this past winter, I discovered Nordic Ski Lab and all of your great technique videos after taking a couple of lessons and realizing I really had a lot to learn. So tell me about how Nordic Ski Lab started and what you guys had in mind. And I'll have to tell listeners that I've been prepped to ask Olivia to tell this story. So go ahead, Olivia. Okay. <laughs> yeah, well, I wasn't really there at the inception of Nordic Ski Lab, so definitely that is uh, Kim's story to tell. I think, yeah, what, what I meant to tell now is how I think Kim got into Nordic Ski Lab, and Kim and I did have a discussion about it. But yeah, my impression was that Kim uh, really got more into skiing after she had kids, and um, she really liked it, and then she liked it so much she wanted to share her passion for it and started teaching. And after years of uh, practicing the technique herself and teaching the technique, she started to find a lot of issues with the way that she had been taught, and she felt frustrated, I think, that her technique wasn't really resembling what she was seeing on uh, the competition circuit, and Kim being the, like, analytic, you know, determined person she was, just wanted to figure out for herself what was going on, why it wasn't working for her, and she just totally, like, picked apart the styles that she'd been taught and thought, there has to be a better way, and then Nordic Ski Lab was born. <laughs> Kim, do you want to add to that? I mean, I think I'm particularly interested in, like, what it was that you, I guess, saw or maybe didn't see in your own technique that you wanted and then also, you know, not everybody's response to that would be to develop this entire online platform. <laughs> right. <laughs> okay. Um, I'll start with the motivation for starting Nordic Ski Lab because it is actually, it, it was different than Olivia's perception. And I won't spend too long talking about it, but the motivation came because of some conversations I was having with a uh, coach here in Calgary and he heads up a training center that Olivia is training at and he's also the head coach or he was the head coach of our local ski club he had coached my kids and he actually came to me originally asking me if I would help with some grant writing for the organization that he heads up this training center and I came back at him with this idea of teaming up to create an online learning platform to share better information about learning ski technique. If, if two people are interested in skiing more in a competition style of cross-country skiing. So that's kind of how it developed. Uh, there was a conversation there, I should mention, with a woman who was on the board of that organization at the time. And she said something to me that was a little bit mind blowing for me at the time. And um, I had come to her and, and I had had the idea that the training center should incorporate as a not for profit. I'm not really sure what their governance structure is or whatever. But anyway, this woman was like a pretty hardcore businesswoman. And she's like, don't do a not for profit, you should do this for profit. And she was like, just so pro business that she really got me thinking more about like, yeah, why couldn't this be a business? So that was an important thing for me because I'd never identified myself as a business person or an entrepreneur or anything like that. And that really opened up um, a, a new new ideas to me that have become, um, I think, like they've made a big difference in my life. That's cool. And then, yeah, the second question that you asked me was related to frustrations around uh, the way ski technique is taught and how you learn. Is that right? Yeah. Like what was the frustration and what were you seeing that wasn't in your skiing? I mean, because for people who don't know skiing, the technique is so crucial. 
the way that I think about it is a lot of really quite older athletes pass me often. <laughs> and I know it's because they have great technique because physically I'm younger and, and I know that I'm fit. True. That is very true. And one of the great things about learning how to ski better is to be the person who's doing the passing on the trail. And especially <laughs> when you're passing that person who you know is younger and fitter than you. So yeah, that was kind of more of a gradual dawning realization. And I kind of feel like I'm still very much having those experiences of feeling frustrated with my technique and continuing to strive to find ways to improve it. It wasn't something, I, it wasn't like a light bulb moment. It's more like a, an ongoing affair. Like I was just talking with Olivia a couple of weeks ago about, uh, she was checking my technique for me and I'm like, man, I still have so far to go. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's one thing I really like about sport. And I say it often is just, it, it is endless. <laughs> <laughs> which is the frustration and the awesomeness. Yeah, skill building is, if you're into that kind of thing, if you like movement, you're interested in in like finding those new efficiencies, then uh, cross-country skiing has like pretty much an unlimited supply of mystery. <laughs> right, right. Well, Olivia, describe how you got involved. It was actually in 2016, uh, I had just finished my season of my competition season. I was dealing with some stress fractures in my feet at the time, so I wasn't going anywhere doing too much. And uh, Chris, who was coaching me at the time, asked if I wanted to be a demo athlete for Kim, who had started this uh, technique website. And I have always, I'm actually, I was raised by two cross-country ski instructors. Both my parents were ski instructors, alpine and, and cross-country. So technique has been something that it's a bit of like a family affair. <laughs> we're all really into it. We all love it. And I had always been obsessed with it and loved to like work on my technique and, and finesse it. And I'd always wanted to be one of the best skiers in Canada, but also one of the goals that was parallel to that was, you know, I always told myself I want to be the best technical skier in Canada. So um, to be asked by Chris to be a demo athlete was like a little rewarding. It felt rewarding for me that my technique was being recognized. And also I was just excited because, you know, I put so many hours into my own technique that to get to actually do something with it other than just race with it was was really cool for me. Yeah, Kim and I met. I did some demo videos for her with Ivan Babikov. And, uh, and then I think we just started to have a lot of fun talking about technique. And I really wanted to create good content for Kim. So especially at the beginning, we would do so many takes and she was you know, she, she was really generous in allowing me to do like multiple takes of my technique and watch the video back every time. So yeah, that's how it started. And and now you guys, it sounds like you guys are like intimate collaborators. Definitely. I would say we are both in the context of Nordic Ski Lab and also with my own technique. I love now sometimes Kim just creates mini videos analyzing my own technique for my own sake, because I'm still trying to improve it. And like you guys both mentioned, you can never stop, um, like there's no end point with cross-country ski technique. It's, you're always working on it and there's always something to improve. And even if you get to whatever your goal technique was, well, the technique is evolving constantly. So yeah, Kim helps me out and I try to help her out with the, with the website and it's a lot of fun and I'm really grateful for it. What's the nitty gritty of actually making these videos and deciding what you're going to focus on and uh, which techniques you're going to highlight. Um, I definitely like to refer to Kim for this one because she actually comes up with most of the ideas and I do more of the, the consulting and the skiing. <laughs> but I think, yeah, Kim goes out and skis and I think her brain is, is always going and she's always thinking about like what makes skiing more efficient or easier. Kim, yeah, do you want to jump in on that? 
Um, sure. But first, I feel like I should just clarify one thing. So Olivia referenced Chris, and Chris was the coach I was talking about earlier, who was kind of there at the inception of Nordic Ski Lab. And when we founded the business, I co-founded it with Chris and my son, Kai Lakoviak, who also was a cross-country ski racer. So the three of us are the original founders of the site. But Olivia has probably evolved into my closest collaborator. And in terms of how we come up with ideas for the videos, like Olivia said, generally the inspiration comes when I'm out skiing and I'm either watching other people ski or thinking about my own technique and the things that I'm trying to achieve. And then I just gradually kind of break down the movements and try to understand the movements And eventually I come up with a strategy that I think will help depending on where I'm at. Like if if I'm actually coaching people at the time, then I will probably test run the idea for a while on other skiers. Or if it's a more advanced idea, I might just apply it to my own skiing and see if it helps. And then I'll go to Olivia and I'll bounce the idea off of her and make sure that it feels right to her. Like that's one thing I think happens maybe with drills in all sports is that sometimes people develop drills and the very, very first time you try them, if you're a coach or an athlete, they don't feel right. And I think sometimes we take these drills and we ignore the fact that they didn't feel right at the beginning. And then we keep running with them. And I prefer to work with drills that feel right, right from the start. So one of the things I really like about working with Olivia is I can give her an idea and get her to try it. And if her initial response is, that feels wrong, then I know it's a bad idea. I'm not going to go any further with it. But if she likes the idea, then we'll map out and bounce ideas off of each other about filming the drill. We'll think about the different ways it can go wrong. How can we visually represent those? And one thing I'll say about Olivia is, and this is true with all the athletes that I have recorded and worked with for this project, they're really bad at skiing badly. So if you want them to demonstrate an error, it's really hard to get them to do it. And one thing that has happened during our collaboration is Olivia has gotten a lot better at skiing badly on demand. So she can like make these adjustments to her technique that are super impressive. It's really impressive to see how she can like change her technique in different ways. Like that is quite a skill she's got now. That's a lot of control. Thanks, guys. It's a tremendous amount of control and awareness. Yeah. That's cool. <laughs> Kim, do you race? Um, I have a little bit in the past, but I find it has, um, like, I always end up with a really sore chest and sore lungs, and it lasts a long time, and so it feels a little bit, it worries me. And um, so, yeah, I tend not to. I know, Elizabeth, that you raced, and do you have that experience? Does it bother you? No, it didn't this last time. So just briefly, like I had this lesson in preparation for the Berkey, and I realized I didn't know what I was doing, basically. And so the whole season leading up to the Berkey was improving my technique and being able to ski better. But I really found that I had sort of technical limitations. So I don't think that I can go super hard because my technique is limited. Does that make sense? I can relate to not being able to get the most out of your capacity just because of like technique inefficiencies, because that's how I feel when I swim. Actually, that year that I had those stress fractures in my feet, the only training I could do when I was recovering from that was swimming and stationary biking. And I hated swimming prior to that. And the first few times I got in the pool, I would do one length, not even a lap, a length of a whatever, 25 meter pool, the half size one. And I was, you know, up on the side of the the pool deck gasping for air. (laughs) I think, yeah, because cross country skiing is so technical that that could be a frustration is like not being able to maximize your capacity because of, yeah, because because you've your technique inefficiencies. But yeah, that's what makes it gratifying when you do find those technique efficiencies eventually. 
Yeah, and I recently spoke to a rower, Michelle Sexer, and she used a term technical endurance, which I just absolutely love. And what she was referring to is that in her racing, you know, rowing is so technical as well. And so she has to be able to be equally proficient at the end of the race as the beginning, which is really hard when you're, you know, busting a gut. Uh, Kim, I asked you about racing because I think it's really interesting that you don't race but are still so concerned with technique. What keeps you interested in improving? You know, because there's this sort of model with athletics or sports that, you know, there has to be this goal, you know, like a competitive goal. And so I actually love training and I love sort of that, what you were talking about, about movement and just sort of improving and watching improvement and sort of just this satisfaction of doing something more efficiently or more easily. But that's not really the vision of what sport is, I don't think. Okay, yeah. So I don't, I don't have a competition in mind. I definitely see the advantage to targeting some kind of a competitive goal and setting your sights on that. I, it probably would help me make progress better. But like I said, like it is physically, I just find it so hard on the lungs that it's unlikely that I would do that. And I know people will say like, um, well, just go and don't go so hard. But if I'm out there in a race and there's other people, then uh, yeah, I'm like, I am going to be competitive and I am, I'm not going to just lollygag along. I'm going to go hard. Right. Um, and like you, I am, I'm super interested in movement. I think moving well, it's not just fun. I think it's also healthy to move well. The better we can move our bodies, I think the better longevity we'll have in terms of being able to continue to move and and move well. So yeah, I'm just, I'm curious. I'm just always curious about what is, what can I possibly do? What skill could I learn? Is it too late for me to learn to do a backflip? You know, like in some ways I feel like <laughs> at this point in my life, I'm in a little bit of a race against time. And I think, oh, is that something I can do before I die? I think that a lot about a lot of things. Like when I was talking to you earlier and looking through all the podcast episodes that you've recorded and all the interesting women that you've recorded, all the different sports that are represented, part of me is like, oh, could I do that? Like, is it too late? Could I do that too? So I don't need a race in order to be motivated. That's cool. I love that. Uh, I want to talk more about longevity, but first, both Kim and Olivia, can you talk a little bit about your sort of sporting background and how you ended up skiing. Olivia, why don't you start? You sort of mentioned that you come from a family of skiers already. Yeah, um, it really is in my family. Yeah, both my parents, like I mentioned earlier, downhill skied. And I like my dad's story. He, you know, Alpine raced when he was in high school. And then I think he started to not necessarily get bored with it, but I think, you know, like all of us here on this podcast, we're just interested in in the challenges of sport. And his dad had opened a cross-country ski shop, the only one in, in my hometown. And he just told my dad, you're going to teach ski lessons. My dad was maybe 18 at the time or 17. And my dad hadn't really cross-country skied before, but he started and then he recognized how much fun it was and how much more difficult it was because he, you know, was already a skilled alpine skier and you require so much more balance on cross country skis. And he said it opened his eyes to like, it made, it made the descents exciting again and thrilling again. Uh, so that was the start of his love affair with cross country skiing. And when he met my mom, my mom was an alpine skier and he introduced her to cross country skiing. And growing up, we all alpine skied as a hobby, but really, we were a cross-country ski family. That's what we did every weekend. And yeah, my dad uh, coached a program that I was in from a very young age, uh, a cross-country ski program that was not focused on competition, but it was really focused on on fun uh, and adventure. The Canadian Ski Marathon was an event that uh, our club, that program revolved around and that our family was really into. So for those who don't know, 
It's 160 kilometers over two days uh, in Quebec. Yeah, there's four categories. You can do it recreationally where you don't have to complete the whole event. You can just do it in sections or you can do the full event, which is called the Coureur des Bois, and you can do the bronze, silver or gold. The bronze is the whole distance. The silver is the whole distance with five kilogram backpack on your back. And then the gold is the five kilogram backpack minimum and you camp overnight. Um, wow. So that was kind of, yeah, like the, the culture of skiing I grew up in. My dad also still to this day takes care of the cross country ski trails in my hometown in Morn Heights, Quebec. So he grooms the, the ski trails here and maintains them. Yeah, so, so I started out in as a baby in a backpack on my dad's back. Then that evolved into me on alpine skis at, I don't know, two and a half, three years old, holding a ski pole between my legs, like a pommel lift as he cross country skied on the ski trails. And then I think around four, they put me on cross country skis and that was it. It was just like, I just have loved it. I've been doing it since before I have memories of doing it and I've always loved it. And I think, yeah, when you're someone who is, um, who is, you know, like I'm a little competitive. I really love to move. I love to train. That was always fun for me. I love the challenge of sport. And when you have developed these skills to, to be like proficient at a sport and you're kind of inclined to be good at it, I think it's natural then to take the competitive route with it. And I started to train in high school. I was kind of a late bloomer. So I wasn't, you know, having huge success as a high schooler, but it was something I really wanted to do. And yeah, as I started to train more seriously, started to get closer to tasting that success. And yeah, here I am now still still doing what I love. <laughs> That's awesome. So Kim, what about you? My sporting background is kind of like generic 1970s style multi-sport, I guess would be the word for it today. So just you know, your typical middle class kid doing lots of sports all year, all year round. So sports in school, soccer in the spring. For about five years, I did competitive synchronized swimming. So I spent a lot of time in the pool growing up. But I didn't like I wasn't, you know, I wasn't a star or anything like that. But I just yeah, I've just enjoyed sports over the year, but I never really would have identified as an athlete. Um, and then in terms of cross country skiing, I did that growing up, we had our house backed onto a golf course. And in the wintertime, my friend and I would just head out our back doors after school on our cross country skis and shuffle around the golf course, mostly looking for hills that we could climb so that we could ski downhill because really we just wanted to ski downhill, but we couldn't really afford it. So <laughs> that's how that's how I grew up. And I thought um, when our kids were older and I was looking for some kind of a winter activity for them. And I just happened to speak with a friend who mentioned that she knew someone whose kids were in the ski club. And that's kind of how we fell into our local ski club. That was a really serendipitous thing for us because I do feel like the ski club made such a big difference to our family. Like Nordic ski clubs are really... They're just full of wonderful people who love being active outside and the whole families will be active. My kids had done some other sports and what I didn't like about the other sports as much was that there wasn't really a place for the parents in the sport. You know, like if your kids are in swimming, you don't get to hop in the pool and, and swim too. And with Nordic skiing and the Nordic ski club, your kids are in the program, but the parents can get on their skis and go out and be active at the same time. And so that kind of brought me back into the sport of cross country skiing. We had done it a little bit with our kids. So when we got to the club, I had been skiing for a long time. I thought it was pretty good. And then that was my first exposure to competition style cross country skiing. And I was like, what the heck are these people doing? Like, what is this? And they're going so fast. And yeah, it was just totally eye-opening for me. And I, I had one of those big moments in your life where you're like, oh, I don't know anything. 
um, which are exciting moments. I think those are exciting moments in our lives and we, and we should embrace them. Talk a little bit more about that, about the difference between what you're calling competition style cross-country skiing and I guess uh, recreational, newbie? I don't yeah, know. Yeah, you know, you... The, the words are difficult because I don't compete myself, but I still love that kind of skiing. And the word competition can be kind of a loaded term. It, it can turn sure. off some parents, especially. Like it would have turned me off if I had, you know, done any research at all and I had looked at different ski clubs before putting my kids into a club if there was like one that said we're a recreational club versus we're a competition club I personally would have chosen the recreational club for my kids I and I like now I just want to hit myself across the head because I know better um (laughs) but so yeah so what are the right words for these things Sometimes I'll say like performance style skiing, competition style skiing, and then recreational skiing. You can ski well and just go out for like an easy recreational ski. It's difficult. I don't know. I don't know that there are words that adequately capture the differences. And one of the things that I really wish is that Um, And one of the things that we're trying to achieve with our website is to just make these more like high performance styles, competition styles, whatever words you want to use. We're trying to make those techniques more accessible and more widely used within, especially within Canada, but within North America and the world. One of the things that I was really struck when I had that moment of like, oh my gosh, I have no idea what I'm doing. And learning the, and I'm gonna botch the names of the two techniques, but there's V1 and V2, remind me what those two are. Yeah, so V1 in Canada, we call that offset. And in Canada, we call V2 one skate, but you you can just say uh, V1 and V2. V1, that's the one that people will naturally kind of, if they're just self-taught, they'll develop a a way of doing something very similar to that technique that we we call it homemade offset. Okay. And then V2, that's the one where you pull with every leg push. I was just going to add that the V1 is a climbing technique or we use it more as a climbing technique. And then the V2 would be more of, uh, it's one of the most, the more versatile techniques you can do it on. Right. Uh, All different kinds of terrain. So that was my revelation because I had been doing the self-taught V1. And so my revelation was, A, like, it's amazing that all self-taught or most self-taught skiers use this technique. And in fact, it's not as efficient. You know, as as soon as I learned the other technique, the V2 technique, I was like, wow, I'm going a lot faster for a lot less energy. So do you have any sense of why people gravitate towards that V1, self-taught V1? I have, um, I do, yeah. So a skate ski has kind of a strange construction to it. It's it's flexed, right? It's not flat. And the edge, when you're just standing on the ski, the, the ski is a little bit off of the snow. So the part under your foot is off of the snow. And it's harder to get the inside edge of the ski into the snow as compared to, say, an ice skate. An ice skate is like you're connected to the ground and that blade is biting into the ice but you have to work a little harder to connect that that ski um, to the snow in order to get an edge to push against and there are different solutions to that problem and the easiest solution is the one that everyone gravitates to and that's the way that it works in this homemade or self-taught v1 and what it is is people fall into a way of kind of twisting their body so if you kind of twist your body that twisting motion will go down into the leg and it will naturally edge the ski for you and so they twist that's why they're pushing on one ski and they rock their body back and forth. So the body sways back and forth with a little bit of a twist, and that is enough that it makes the ski uh, makes the skis work. It's the easiest way to make the skis work. Oh, that's that's my theory. Yeah, that's interesting. So I want to talk about longevity, and you've 
both have mentioned it. And I know, Olivia, you had an injury, and there's a great video or audio of you on the Nordic Ski Lab website talking about this injury and what happened and whatnot. But what was fascinating about your story is how it ended up actually good. Can you talk about that and sort of what you learned from that and, you know, in the context of longevity and being able to ski forever, we hope? Yeah. Oh, my God. Skiing forever. That is something that just makes me smile. It makes me think of Jackrabbit Johansson, the legend, <laughs> skiing past 100 years old goals. Um, yeah, the injuries, I've had a few uh, and definitely I'd say like the theme of my career and and what's probably true for most athletes that, um, you know, persevere through injuries is that you almost do always come out better once you've recovered and rehabbed from the injury because likely the injury arose from some like deficiency or some weird movement pattern or some weird alignment thing you had going on and when you're injured it forces you to like to work on that so yeah the injury that that you're referring to was when i had a herniated disc in my neck and it was set off by uh, I was in my car at a red light and I was rear-ended by another car. And I think, yeah, that obviously gave me whiplash and that's what really like gave me the injury. But after getting some imaging done on my back, I realized that I have a lot of disc degeneration and probably that injury was going to happen sooner or later anyway. And I'd always had pretty bad posture uh, most of my life. And even when I tried to have good posture, I found it absolutely exhausting to stand upright with my shoulders back. I just didn't have like <laughs> the the strength or the, the, the muscular like endurance to maintain good posture for more than 30 seconds. It felt like it was very bizarre, but that's how it felt. And when I had the neck injury, anything but perfect posture gave me neck pain. So uh, in a way, you know, injuries absolutely force you to address the the issues that you have so muscularly my my back and all of those postural muscles were super tired while i was rehabbing from that neck injury but it forced me to like build up that you know that muscle mass or that strength to to maintain a good posture and also i was really really lucky that i found some really good supportive um, like therapists and doctors and strength coaches who, you know, addressed my neck injury, but then they were looking all the way up and down the chain, you know, seeing what was going on with my feet and my hips. And it didn't just stop at the neck, you know, they they were of the opinion that everything in your in your body can affect your neck. So the way that I stand on my feet, if I'm favoring, you know, at the time I was still I'd never, I guess, properly addressed the the stress fractures in my feet. My approach to that was more like unweight them and protect them. They were on, on the inside of my feet. So I developed this way of standing that weighted the outsides of my feet. And they're like, you know, we need to work on this because that that's going to affect all the links in the chain all the way up to your neck. So, yeah, I really just committed 100% to this process of, of rehabilitation and... I came out so much better because of it, so much better connected, better aligned. Yeah, I think it's given me a better base to work off of now, and I'm less prone to injury now than I used to be. So, yeah. I love that idea that injury is a result of movement patterns, because I, I definitely think that's true. And I think we often attribute injury to other stuff when, in fact, we need to look about how we're moving. So how did you, like really in detail, like how did you go about strengthening your postural muscles? Um, yeah, a lot of shoulder and, and back exercises. So kind of, you know, like lying face down, doing those prone W's where you, you keep your thumbs pointed to the ceiling and then you're just kind of squeezing your shoulder blades behind you. Lots of cable machine exercises. I really had to develop, yeah, the, the muscles in, in my back and also learn better how to connect 
my core, like my inner core, kind of, you know, pelvic tilt kind of things. And yeah, um, what else? <laughs> I always, yeah, I, I was doing a ton of, of kind of arm movements. Uh, you know, you, you want to move like in all, all different planes of movement while being able to maintain that posture. So I think, yeah, what was different, especially when I was going to the gym, was that posture became an important element of every single strength exercise I was doing. So, you know, I was doing a lot of, of squats, kind of like split lunges, but the most important component of all of those exercises was always, you know, my posture. So the physio or the strength coach would make sure that it looked like, you know, you have a string pulling you up from the top of your head. So that was step number one. And I was only allowed to move through the strength movement if the posture looked good. So then, yeah, I guess I was relearning how to do all different kinds of movements with good posture and training that in the gym in a really like focused, controlled environment. And you're still doing that now? Yeah. And thankfully, oh, I'm so thankful I've gotten to a point where I don't have to think about it as much because <laughs> I used to have to flex my brain yeah. really hard to make sure that everything was aligned. And I can't believe it. But yeah, all of the hours I put in have paid off and I can do it just more easily now. It's definitely like my more natural state to have a better posture and better like activation in the places I need it. But I think just because I trained it so much, it's something that I, I think about always when I'm moving is just like, is my posture good? Are my shoulders set? Is, you know, I don't want my pelvis like tucked all the way, you know, like you don't want to exaggerate it, but you want it neutral. So just making sure it's neutral, that kind of thing. How long did it take you to get, I mean, maybe not to the point where you are now, but to a point where it wasn't exhausting to be thinking about that? Um, it was under a year before my first race of, of like doing the rehab, uh, my first race back. And, and that went pretty well, but I'd say like eight months to a year before it started to feel a little more natural. It was like gradually over time. Like I remember, I guess when, you know, I started skiing again and skiing better, but I don't remember when it became like less of an effort to think about. Right. The other thing that you mentioned in that audio of your story was about strengthening your glutes. How does that work with your shoulders? Like explain that chain that happens. The glutes, I think <laughs> I totally drank the Kool-Aid on the glutes. And it's funny now that, that you bring that up because in the last year, I've just started to be coached by some Norwegian coaches, Norwegian ski coaches, and they can't understand. They didn't realize how obsessed North Americans were with their glutes. <laughs> like here we, you know, we say your glutes can save your life. <laughs> <laughs> the glutes are the center of everything and they matter so much. And I really bought into that uh, and I still believe in it. But yeah, I just thought it was really interesting to hear my coach's take on it. They're like, why do you guys care so much and why do you work on this so much? But I feel like any weight bearing sport, you know, where you're standing on two feet or especially one foot, your balance comes from your glutes. That's what I learned through that experience, because as I strengthened my glutes, my balance got way better and your absorption becomes way better. So like when you're running, I noticed that with stronger glutes, I had less lower leg pain. I was less prone to lower leg injury. So yeah, stability, balance. I think too, in a sport like cross-country skiing where you're using your upper body, your poles, you know, like all of that power, you want to transfer it as effectively as possible into the ground, into the snow to move yourself forward. So every link in that chain needs to be as stable as possible so that you're not leaking energy in too many places. And the hip is, is a super strong joint. Like you, you move a lot from your hips in skiing. You can get a lot of power out of your, like out of that joint in skiing. And so I think we're better served to have stronger, more stable glutes to like for that, that power transfer and also just that stability and that balance. I just wanted to comment a little bit on uh, what Olivia was saying and all the work that she's done on her posture 
And two things I think that people might find interesting are, number one, it is one of the reasons why I use Olivia so much in our videos is because she does have really lovely posture now. And generally in the sport, that's not the case. So it's hard to find athletes who have great posture and can exhibit technique while maintaining good posture. So she really stands out that way. And it's been of tremendous benefit to, um, to our website. And then the second thing I wanted to mention is just kind of an interesting observation. So we've been making videos together now for about six years. And I've watched her develop and her style evolve during this time and one of the things I think is so interesting was that when we first filmed her and she didn't have great posture and she wasn't thinking about it so before her injury she had this like real kind of like um carefree spirit to her skiing that was really lovely to watch and then when she was injured and really focused on her posture, her scheme became a little bit more guarded and a little more restrained. It kind of, it lacked that, um, that quality that it had had before. So her posture was better, but she had kind of lost a little bit of the flow. And now I feel like she's in this place where she's recaptured the ease and kind of being a little bit more carefree and joyful in her technique. And anyway, I just thought that would be something that people would be interested to hear about how things can change over time. And like she said, overall, you come out at the other end in a much better place, even if you're in a little bit of a place now where you're struggling or feeling injured and discouraged. Well, let me ask a follow-up question to that. How, as a coach, both you know, like in person, but also through the website, how do you deal with posture? And particularly because Olivia's work took so long. I mean, it, it took a lot of months and also required not just sort of, you know, okay, you should have good posture, but you need the muscle support and the ability to actually hold that posture. So it's not something that's, I don't know, I wouldn't think it would be easy to coach and just say, hey, get better posture. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> we do try to infuse the idea of moving in ways that are, as currently understood, to be more healthy, which basically all comes back to posture. So we try to infuse that into all of our content and all of our messaging. But if someone really does have issues with posture, I'm not going to fix that for them with ski technique videos. Of course, so yeah. you've got to, you've got to do the work like Olivia did off snow with professionals who can help you in that regard. Do you talk about that? I, I can't remember if I've seen that on the website. Um, it's more like if people are asking questions about it at a certain point in the conversation, I would say like if they, if they're having a technique issue and I can see that it's related to their posture and alignment, then I would encourage them at that point to go and work with a physiotherapist or a strength trainer, a combination of people, and try to address it off snow. It's so interesting that this conversation has started because very recently, and again, going back to the rower interview, is that this idea of not having the muscles to do the thing that you want to do is an inhibitor and you have to address that before you can you know actually do the kind of technique and so the the rower for example was saying her coach would be screaming at her to you know like a sit up straighter and she was like i can't yeah it is interesting the uh, i should mention the one other thing that we do is that there are some cues and ideas in technique that i think are contrary and will actually can actually be damaging and potentially damaging and detrimental. So cues that are suggesting that the skier should like heavily flex through the back, things like that have been quite widespread in the sport and they are gradually diminishing and becoming less popular, but we do advocate pretty vocally against that category of drills and cues. Can you explain that more? 
Um, yeah, like so the one that I just mentioned, that one was called the ab crunch cue. And for many, many years, skiers have been told that they need to crunch down onto their poles. And that's very evocative of like a very strong flexion movement through the spine. And we would encourage people to aim to have more of a neutral spine posture. So that would be an example of a cue in that category. Got it. Also related to polling, you know, cross country skiing is a little bit funny. Normally you go around and we've got two legs, but in cross country skiing, we're, we're using all four of our limbs for propulsion. So we're kind of turned ourselves into four legged creatures and we lean forward a little bit when we do that, that puts more strain on the back as well. But we're also like engaging a lot more force through the arms and through the shoulder girdle which is not really what it's designed for. And you can get really sloppy in your posture through your shoulders. It's super easy, especially when you're tired. And there's a lot of kind of like scrunching up of the shoulder girdle up around the neck and ears in the sport, especially when you're more tired or you're going at a harder effort. So it's quite a visible feature of ski racing. You'll see it in a lot of ski racers. So that's another area where I think that the sport needs to move um, and be more, bring bring more awareness and and be more conscious about how we're training people how to move, in order to prevent the issues that could potentially arise from these poor postural habits. Did that make sense? Yeah, yeah, and it's also interesting. I mean, we didn't get to the question about longevity, but that certainly seems that it fits right into that is, you know, like maintaining good posture, being able to to do it for long term. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. So you mentioned off season training, I'm really interested in what you guys do off season. And, you know, sort of very specifically, but just, you know, like globally, snow is not available all year in most places. So like, what kind of training do you recommend for non-snow months? This one's on you, Olivia. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, okay, well, I'll come at this question from an athlete perspective um, and say that we're... Oh, my God. Okay, now I just want to talk about how much I love being a cross-country ski athlete because <laughs> I think our cross-training is the best of any sport. <laughs> I'm super biased, but, oh, we have so much freedom and flexibility with our cross training because really we're just trying to get loads of zone one hours in so we do a ton of running hiking mountain biking road biking um and a lot of roller skiing especially yeah i would say that's that's the focus is is roller skiing through the summer and especially in the fall just because it's the closest thing we can get to skiing on snow but yeah, pretty much any endurance activity goes for cross training if you're just focusing on on maintaining fitness. For technique, yeah, roller skiing is is number one. Balance, you know, exercises in the gym are always helpful. And if you're super lucky, you have access to a roller ski treadmill, and that's an opportunity to get like really, uh, just to have a really concentrated dose of of technique work. You can get the same amount of benefit from like 30 minutes on the roller ski treadmill as, you know, 90 minutes out on roller skis working on your technique because you have video cameras in the front, on the side, or a mirror and a coach watching you and you can just stare at your every single stride. (laughs) (laughs) Tell me more about roller skis. What's it like to be on the road on those things and like how do they work and how do you break and, you know, like what are some of the concerns? and fun bits yeah some people love it some people hate it uh some people are in between the two we have classic roller skis and skate roller skis uh skate roller ski is just a shaft it's like either aluminum or some composite material with a wheel on each end and a regular uh, cross-country ski binding on it and you ski on them the same way you would rollerblades or cross-country skis and then a classic roller ski the same kind of shaft, one wheel on each end, but one of the wheels has a ratchet on it so it doesn't roll backwards so that you can actually kick forwards. You should wear a helmet when you roller ski and something high vis. And yeah, if you're on a bike path or a roller ski track, 
it feels fairly safe for sure. Like the biggest concern when you're on roads is the danger of traffic. So it's not super fun to roller ski on roads, especially in places where uh, the drivers aren't familiar with roller skiers. My favorite roller ski workouts are, you know, training camps in the summer when we get to roller ski these cool mountain passes. We often have training camps in places like Park City, uh, which has a ton of really lovely roller skiing. I find, yeah, just a note on, on roller skiing is the best, my best roller ski workouts usually happen uh, when they're supported by a team or a coach with a vehicle. So for safety, first of all, they can, you know, follow you on those, on those long skis and check in and make sure everyone's doing okay. And also you can roller ski up a long pass and then, you know, a pass that might be dangerous to roller ski down because we don't have brakes on our roller skis. So uh, you just get a ride down in the car or the team van. You can buy roller skis that have a a braking system attached to uh, the leg. So if you scoot your your foot forward, then, you know, the back of your calf would would press on this lever that works as a brake against the the wheel of your roller ski. But most of us don't have that. uh, And yeah, I think we have a video. I don't know if it's on the website, but of a few different braking techniques or slowing techniques for roller skis. They're all like pretty awkward. You know, one of the best ways to slow down or stop on roller skis is to just roll into the grass or, you know, roll up and uphill, make sure that you have like a straight run out or an uphill after a downhill. So yeah, it's it's dangerous. I think, I don't know anyone who wasn't scared their first year on roller skis. I didn't like roller skiing the first couple of years that I did it, but as you get more comfortable, you can start to have fun with it. I still though prefer skiing on snow like 400 times more than I prefer <laughs> roller skiing. Are you thinking about roller skiing, Elizabeth? I've thought about it. I, you know, like I'm older. I don't know if I need to do that. <laughs> <laughs> I just the thought of crashing just seems uh, not worth it. Yeah, I think in my opinion that we need to take up the level of protection worn by cross-country skiers. So the good skiers like Olivia, all of her peers, they're out there like, you know, they don't crash very often. And it's for some reason, safety gear always has like a little bit of a nerd connotation. You know, as soon as you put on protection, you look a little bit nerdy or whatever. It's you know, there's a resistance, especially with young kids, but I roller ski and I got some mountain bike protection last year and I wear it roller skiing and mountain biking. They have really good stuff. Like you probably know that, right? Mm -hmm. Um, So what are you wearing? Like I'm wearing these, the pads I have on, I wear knee pads and I have elbow pads. The elbow pads I bought for roller blading. I also have roller blade. And those ones aren't as slick as my knee pads. My knee pads are super slick and they're mountain biking pads and you don't even know they're on. And I kind of, I'm like, everyone should be wearing them because yeah, the good skier, the good roller skiers, like you probably haven't fallen in a long time, but the, the risk with a fall is so extreme. Like you can really hurt yourself. And so in my opinion, everyone should be wearing more protection. That's interesting. I tend to fall a lot because I, you know, sort of push it with technique that I'm not really ready for. So yeah, <laughs> yeah I, I, that's one one reason. I well, on. yeah. And I do like, I, I roller ski differently than I ski on snow. I hmm. ski more conservatively. And maybe if I do more of it this summer and I feel more comfortable, I'll, um, I'll become a little bit bolder. But I do, I wear protection and I ski conservatively. But I still really like it, and I definitely think it helps me when it comes time to being on snow. Oh, if I'm you sure. have limited opportunities, I would encourage you to give it a try. And where do you ski? Like on what, like mm, trails? I tend to go out of the city. You can do it in the city here. I used to live outside the city in a little community about 45 minutes away, so I know the roads out there, and I know some quiet areas. So I, I go out there. And I will do it in my neighborhood in the city. I'm just a little more careful, but there are people around who will will go out on more ambitious routes. And I might start doing that. We'll see. 
Yeah. Well, Olivia, so what's your year like? Like, when will you get back onto the snow and when does your season stop? And do you travel around searching for snow? Yeah, it depends on on the team or on your own personal philosophy, I guess, as an athlete and on the, the team you're with for how much you search for snow in the summer. It's really cool to be out west in, in the Rockies because our season, our competition season ends usually around the end of March. And then April is typically the off season for cross country skiers. Uh, and then May 1st is usually when the training season starts. And so for instance, May 8th, I will be back on snow uh, for a training camp at Mount Fortress, which is in Kananaskis country you know, fairly close to Canmore, Alberta, where I live now. Uh, So yeah, we're going to have really good spring skiing conditions there. And we'll ski there for a couple weeks. Then we have options to go up to the Hague Glacier, which is in the same region. There's usually skiing there until August, but that is, you know, you need a helicopter to get your gear up to the glacier. It's pretty expensive. And yeah, there are options for finding snow in the summer you'd have to then take a flight somewhere either to a glacier in Austria or you go to New Zealand during their winter. You ski on snow there. But yeah, that's obviously very costly to to do as well. And you're now, because you were at the Olympics, this past Olympics, so you're now on the Canadian national team. Logistically, what does that mean in terms of your training and where you're going to be in for this next competitive season and leading up to that? Yeah, actually, uh, interestingly, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm not actually on the national team uh, and making the Olympic team did not guarantee me a spot on the Canadian national team. So still not on the, the national team. So I'll still just be training with, um, or not just, don't get me wrong, I love it. I will be training with the Alberta World Cup Academy this year. And so I'll be doing camps with uh, the Academy and yeah next season again i don't have any race starts guaranteed at any event so it's gonna resemble last season for me which is like i have to i have to race my way there i have to find a way to race my way back onto the world cup wow that's tell me more about the canadian system how that works and how to get on the national team and i understand you had a a quite a race series to get on the olympic team yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, I mean, there's there's criteria set every year uh, that stipulate what kind of results you need to get onto the national team. And if you don't meet that criteria, then you don't get named to the team. And they do try to make the criteria, uh, you know, so that you need to be performing quite well, especially the criteria gets more difficult to meet the older you are. They expect a lot more from the older athletes. So... Yeah, I didn't meet the objective criteria, and that's why I'm not on the team. It can be harder to get onto the team also as an older athlete because the criteria uh, is usually written for World Cup race results. And, you know, so you need to be, first of all, you need to be on the World Cup to, to even have a chance of meeting that criteria. And getting onto the World Cup if you're not already on the national team is is a difficult thing to do. <laughs> so <laughs> it's hard. Um but you're not that old. Oh, well, <laughs> I've, I've been made to believe that I am. No, no, uh, I'm 29 uh, and I am deaf. Yeah, I'm the oldest woman in Canada still competing. So that makes me feel old in Canada. <laughs> wow. Can I jump in here? Please do, yeah. Olivia has some interesting opinions and perspectives about how older Canadian athletes could be supported and why that would be an important thing for the national sport organization to maybe think about more. Is that right, Olivia? Yeah. I'd love to hear that. Yeah, like I mentioned earlier, I'm the like one of the oldest or the oldest woman competing in Canada and have been for a couple of years at 29. And I think that that's kind of unique to Canada, unfortunately, that we don't have that many people still competing in the second half of their 20s. The people who do tend to keep competing later into their 20s are the people who are, you know, are already on the national team and are supported. 
But in the States, you know, on the domestic circuit, you see a lot more women in their late 20s and early 30s and in Europe as well. I think that's because in Canada, we kind of base our performance benchmarks on the performance benchmarks of the Scandinavians, when in reality, we don't have the same development model. And I think that we need to like create a system for ourselves that, you know, because we have like a different development model, I think it takes us longer to develop athletes in Canada because we don't have as strong development, you know, for high school skiers. I would just love it if in Canada we found a way to support skiers just to get to their their late 20s because when you look at the most successful Canadian skiers, their most successful seasons were happening near the end of their career in their late 20s. So to me, it would make sense that, you know, we like actually want to encourage Canadian skiers to get to that point in their career where they're performing at their best rather than trying to weed them out when they're 23 and, you know, saying if you haven't made it by the time you're 23, then it's going to be it's just going to become harder from here. So, yeah, I think because our development system is is different that, uh, yeah, we need a, a bit of a different approach to supporting athletes. And I think if we had more athletes uh, still competing and, and supported in their late 20s, we might have more success internationally. We don't have the luxury, you know, like like other countries do of having a huge population uh, of, you know, high level skiers. So I think we need to like nurture the ones that we have and, and support them and help them get to, to the peak of their careers. This is a quick break to say, Hear Her Sports is taking its annual late summer break, starting August 1st. I'll still be around, so keep connecting via social and email. During the time off, making episodes, I'll be working on some behind-the-scenes things, doing a bit of travel, and mostly enjoying outside. This is a great time for you to catch up on older episodes if you haven't listened to them all. Plus, there will be a couple of bonus episodes posted during the next month. And of course, enjoy the outside yourself. And now let's get back to Kim and Olivia of Nordic Ski Lab. Kim, tell me more about your business. And, and you mentioned that it is a business and it's not a not-for-profit. So what have you learned and, and what are your plans? Um, well, I have learned to think of myself as an entrepreneur, which might sound like a small thing, but that was a pretty big thing for me. And to think of it as a business. And it is a small business, and there are many, many parts to it. And I'm the main person doing the work behind the business. So I have to do a lot of different kinds of tasks and learn a lot of different things. Um, that sometimes is kind of exhausting. My favorite part of the business is making the videos. And I think without that part of it, I'm not even sure I could sustain it because that that kind of creative outlet is is very enjoyable for me. In terms of the business, the business is about I guess next year it'll be six years old and it's growing really well. I think primarily because of the videos that I've put up on YouTube and also word of mouth. So we've never really gotten the hang of marketing and we've never invested a lot of money in marketing, but the business has continued to grow. So that's been kind of the magic of, of the online business world, like what can happen just through search and word of mouth. We have members from, I haven't counted for a while, but I, I'm going to say over 40 countries from around the world. And that's been um, just exciting, gratifying. We have a community forum, so people will post pictures of where they're skiing in different parts of the world or introduce themselves. And it's just great to be able to make those connections and see people all over the world loving the sport in similar ways. The way that Nordic Ski Lab is set up is that I always thought about the growth in all aspects of it. So I always tried to make things so that they would kind of self-perpetuate. So putting a video on YouTube is a sort of self-perpetuating form of marketing. You can you put a lot of work into it 
at one point in time, but it continues to feed and generate growth. So that, and also just in, like when you have a website, you always have to like attend to the website, the structure of the site, the speed of the site, and make sure that it's doing well in search and things like that. So that's kind of one of the amazing things about having an online business is it's really democratized business and and made it possible for someone like me to create something like this and have it grow into something that's quite sizable. So it's been fun. But at the same time, like you said, we kept the price very affordable. I think that we have one of the most affordable and good value subscription services out there. And I do that on for a number of reasons. One is to try to relieve pressure so that I don't feel like I have to be churning out content all the time. This year it has been a high content year, but I still want to be able to say like, I got to back off here just for my own mental health and still feel very confident that people are getting great value from the money they're spending. And then also the lower price, we do have like a broader mission of trying to grow the sport and improve the level of skiing in the country. And so keeping the price low helps us achieve that goal. And it it's just, it is kind of part of marketing too. Like if you can pre- keep your price lower, it's easier for someone who comes to the site like you did and said, oh, I like this video, I'd like more of this. Usually when you're in that situation, you go to the site, you always have this little feeling like, oh, how much is this going to cost? You know, do, how much do I really want it? And I hope that people come and they look at the price and they go like, oh, wow, actually, that's totally doable for me. And then they pull the trigger. Right. Well, that was my experience. Good. What's in the works for this coming up season? Whew. Well, I always approach this time of year where it's a little bit like New Year's resolution time for me. So you know how on like January or December 31st, you're like all set to start your new life on January 1st, where you're going to transform into this amazing person <laughs> and t- and set all these resolutions. That's what I do at this time of year with regards to the business. I'm like, I am going to audit every single video that's on the website and remake all the ones that I need to. And I'm going to like totally redo the design of the website and really try to make it more user friendly. And yeah, just on and on, like those two tasks themselves that would That's a mammoth idea right there. But I always come into this season thinking that because I don't, uh, we'll still make video. Olivia and I will do some things on roller skis probably this summer, but I would like to use the summer to start to just reorganize and tidy things up. But what ends up happening is the sun comes out and I just want to go outside and I don't want to sit in front of my computer anymore. So that's why it's understandable like new year's <laughs> resolutions yeah <laughs> right and olivia what are your goals for this season coming up and what do you have planned i'm really excited for this season because i'd say last season uh for, for the last like six years i've been dreaming of having uh one you know off training season one summer without any setbacks and one competition season without any hiccups either and this past season, this past year was the first year that I've put together like that. And I was so thrilled with the results from it. And, you know, my next dream would be to put together two full years without any major setbacks or interruptions to my training or racing. As most people in endurance sport might be familiar with, the the gains come later that they, they take time. So, you know, you don't usually see the benefit of the training you've done in the summer immediately in the winter it really is the accumulation of years of consistent high quality training that pay off so i'm excited to see what i can do with with two seasons of training so yeah i'm just looking forward to like more consistency this summer building my fitness uh improving my race speed and hopefully yeah another like injury free interruption free season of racing next season I'd say my big goals are to um, get selected to the world championship team. World champs will be in Slovenia next winter. And I really just want to get back onto the World Cup. I really want to be racing at that level. And I think that, yeah, I'm capable of, of better results 
if I, you know, keep putting the training in and I just really want to see, like, I want to find that consistency in, in results also in the winter. So I'm excited. We've talked a little bit about longevity and I'm curious, sort of, you're not the youngest racer. I don't think that you're old, but you're certainly on the upper end. So like, how do you feel about that? And yeah. I think when I, you know, was in the bubble and in like the Canadian bubble, I was feeling quite self-conscious about it. And I get asked frequently, you know, if I'm going to retire, like the word we use to, to stop, you know, competing uh, or racing competitively, or if this is going to be my last season and when I've never really indicated that I was interested in, in retiring or, um, yeah, like moving away from the sport. So I think just being asked those questions over and over again makes you feel like maybe you should be moving on, even if it's not what you want for yourself. But I think what changes that for me is just, you know, I'm, I'm encouraged by, by my own results. I am still motivated. I think that I'm going to know, you know, when I want to move on, I'm going to feel it and I'm going to notice that motivation wane and that motivation is still there for me. And then being exposed to, you know, older athletes who are still enjoying themselves, improving and uh, who are still motivated themselves too. I met a ski cross athlete at the Olympics, Brittany, who is a year older than I am. And we were talking about, you know, like her journey and what was up next for her. And she said she was super motivated to compete at the next Olympics, which is four years away. And I thought that was really inspiring. And I listened to one of your recent podcasts with Helen Wyman, and she had mentioned that her best years were from 29 years old to 33 years old. And that's kind of, you know, that's the portion of my career that I'm entering now. And yeah, and if I really, you know, if I step out of that Canadian bubble and I I look at cross-country skiers in general from other nations on the World Cup, a lot of athletes are, you know, having a lot of success in their late 20s, early 30s. And that's true of Canadians, too. I don't know why in Canada we think it's so important to, you know, reach those peak performances when you're young or show that you're capable of those peak performances when you're in your early 20s when our best Canadian athletes had, you know, the best performances of their career near the end of their careers in their late twenties or early thirties as well. So that's how I'm looking at it from a, a personal perspective right now. I, I just always focus on one year at a time and I'm excited for, for this next year. So this, in this next year to get to the world cup, you're reliant on team Canada. So what do you need from them? What do you want from them? And what are they giving you? Yeah, I guess what I want from them is uh, <laughs> I just, you know, I, I want the opportunity. I think that's what we all want is just the opportunity to to prove ourselves. And, and if we can prove that we are, you know, among the best in Canada, that then we get those opportunities at the World Cup and on the international stage. And we will have qualification races, trials races for world champs. So, yeah. You just have to prioritize those races and race fast at those races. Um, What am I getting from them? I mean, I got so much support this past season, you know, after making the Olympic team. It was really great. The the COC took really great care of us. And on the World Cup, I felt really well taken care of, too, and really included in the team. And I was really grateful for that. Um, But because I'm not in the system, like this summer, you know, I won't be part of any camps or getting any funding in that way. But um, yeah, we'll see. (laughs) And when is that first qualification race? I think it's in January. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Got it. So you have quite a bit of time. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, I'm not sure if there'll be any avenues to get uh, for, for, for myself to get onto the World Cup in period one, which are the races before Christmas. But they might be taking athletes to the tour to ski, which happens like right after Christmas around New Year's. But they really, they haven't released like that calendar yet uh, or the the criteria for making those events. So yeah, I'm not really sure at this point. So Olivia, when you say that you wish that there were more opportunities to prove yourself, 
Can you envision something where there would be like a qualifier that would get you into period one? Is that is that an idea that you've thought of, or how? I'm just wondering in practical terms what what kind of things would open up more opportunities for athletes like yourself. Yeah, that's a really good question, and I'm not going to pretend that I can solve, um, or you know that I that I have the like the answer to basically how to like raise the, the level of skiing in Canada and for Canadian skiers and get us all onto the international stage. It's a really hard job and I don't envy the people who are in the like the high performance director job. Yeah, do I want trials for those races? My personal answer would be, yeah, that would be great. I know it's more complicated than that. Where I think the gap really is, is that we have our own domestic circuit, which is, it used to be known as the NORAM circuit. Now, I guess we can call it the Canadian Continental Cup Series. And then unless you find races with your club or on your own, the next level is the World Cup. And it is such a massive jump between the two. Like it, there's, there's, yeah, it, it's always a shock for Canadians to go from our Continental Cup Series, our domestic series to the World Cup. And it's really hard to perform on demand when you, you know, you, you, you make that jump. So I think what we're missing, and I think that Nordic Canada is aware of this and they are working on it. And they had some really good tours this past year to, to address that. But what we're missing is, is yeah, that stepping stone in between. So I think I would have benefited a lot from doing more international racing below the World Cup level. I think that would have raised my level of skiing uh, when I was younger and I would have been better prepared to perform when I did get the opportunity to race on the World Cup because it's a lot to ask of an athlete to go from a domestic race in Canada where we don't have, you know, a ton of depth to being on the World Cup where it's nuts like how high the level is. Everyone is an amazing skier and every race they are ascending it and it's so unforgiving to have a bad race on the World Cup. Like, yeah, it can be the difference between you know, on a good day, you can be in the top 30. And then if you're just off a little bit, you can be last. I feel like that's a good place to ask him about her role of uh, Nordic Ski Lab and sort of, you know, encouraging more people to ski. Yeah, I think when I say raising the level of cross-country skiing in Canada. And really, I think of Canada and the US as being very much together within the sport of cross country skiing, because the athletes from both countries interact together at camps a lot, there's a lot of support between them. And we're kind of like over here away from Europe, where the sport has a higher profile. So I, I do feel like we need to we need to band together. So when I say Canada, I really mean North America. But I would like to see more people skiing in general, and I would like more people to understand the possibilities of skiing with techniques that are more like what the competitive skiers are doing. You can go out into the woods and just kind of shuffle around on your skis or teach yourself how to skate ski and have a marvelous time. And there's nothing wrong with that. But a lot of people are doing that without even knowing that there's this whole other world out there of this what we could call performance style skiing or competition style skiing. And that that is not as inaccessible as they might think. So that if they're interested in that, we can help them and make that kind of skiing more accessible to them. And if they're not interested in that, that's perfectly fine too. Like it's just great to see more people skiing. I'm surprised that you lumped Canada and U.S. together. I sort of picture, like, most Canadians skiing. (laughs) Uh, I don't know. I think we play hockey. If you go to the, uh, (laughs) if you go to a Canadian ice rink in the winter time, you'll be amazed at how great we are at skating. Like (laughs) as a nation, every time I go to a rink, I'm like, man, we're just killing it. We're so good at this. (laughs) That's funny. Well, thank you both for being on the podcast. I'm so grateful for that. 
Thank you so much for the opportunity. It was it was such a pleasure to get to talk to you and have this experience. Yeah, totally. Thanks, Elizabeth. This was great. And that is our show for this week. Remember, Hear Her Sports is taking its annual summer break. And there will be bonus episodes coming your way during that time, so be sure to subscribe if you are not already. Thank you to Kim and Olivia. I am looking forward to staying in touch with them, using Nordic Ski Lab if, or should I say when, I start roller skiing, and following Olivia through her season starting in January. Check out the show notes at hearhersports.com for links to things discussed in the episode and for links to our sponsor, The Feed. Keep tuning in to every episode of Hear Her Sports. There is so much to talk about surrounding women's sports, so it's fantastic you are here. Tell your friends about the show, or just tell them about what you heard and learned on the show. There are other ways to keep the conversation going. Hear Her Sports is on social with the handle Hear Her Sports. You can send me an email to elizabeth at hearhersports.com. I always love hearing from you and definitely will respond. And remember to sign up for the Hear Her Sports newsletter, Sign up at hearhersports.com. Until next time, bye-bye. Hey there, and welcome to the Joy of Paddle podcast, hosted by me, Minter Dial a veteran of the paddle tennis world, and sponsored by Paddle 1969. Whether you're a paddle tennis aficionado, just beginning or have never even heard of paddle, or padel as it's called in North America, this is an exhilarating new show that delves into the captivating stories of notable paddle personalities worldwide. In its inaugural season, you'll be treated to exclusive anecdotes, valuable tips, life lessons, and humorous moments shared by esteemed professional paddle players industry insiders, and passionate paddle enthusiasts. With each season aligning with the Pro Tour, you can anticipate two engaging episodes per month. The Joy of Paddle Podcast is part of the Evergreen Podcast Network, where you can find other great shows in a number of categories, such as sports, health and wellness, true crime, and fiction. To find out more about Evergreen Podcasts, go to www.evergreenpodcast.com. Vamos! Vamos!